the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history wield tanks. Tank triathlon comparing top tier AA tech of different nations and metal beasts with one of the contestants. The Sidam 25 self-propelled anti-aircraft weapon appeared in the game some time ago along with the other Italian ground vehicles. But Update 1.91 brought us a new, modified version of this machine. Meet the Sidam 25 Mistral, a top Italian SPAA with a BR of 10.0 and a lot heavier weapons than before. In addition to the four 25mm Orlicans inherited from the early modification, this machine has two pods with Mistral guided missiles. We'll talk about them in a minute. The driver is situated in the frontal part of the hull next to the engine and transmission, and the gunner, along with the loader, sit closer to the rear part. And then there is the armor. Or, to be correct, there is no armor. The Sidam isn't even protected against enemy autocannons, as it is based on the American M113 APC. But its main advantage is the missiles that basically work like that. You launch them, and then you can forget about them. Just aim and launch. The missile will do the rest on its own. And quite effectively indeed, thanks to the great speed, maneuverability, and G-tolerance. Uh, there is a catch, though. First, the guidance system works in IR spectrum, which means that the missile can be easily tricked with flares or IRCM. Second, the effective range of these missiles is lower than on any other SPAA, only five and a half kilometers. Plus, you've only got six of them. So before you launch and forget, you need to pick the right target and time of launch. And finally, this machine has no radar, only an optoelectronic fire guidance system, so you'll need to spot the target in the sky with more, well, <laughs> orthodox methods. On the other hand, the helicopters that have radar warning receivers won't find this Italian as easy as any of its colleagues, especially those who only use radar. In all other cases, this is the same Sidam 25 an effective weapon against enemy aviation mounted on a slow and light armored platform. Under no circumstances can it encounter any opposing ground tech. But if push comes to shove, the Italian has got 60 APDS rounds that can destroy even an MBT if fired in its side. The cannons have two plane stabilizers, so they are quite comfortable to use. Remember though, that your four barrels have a breathtakingly fast fire rate, so you might run out of those APDS rounds before you can say, wow, that fire rate is breathtakingly fast. So do try to stay away from those on your altitude. Your targets are in the sky, especially the helicopters, and you've got an ideal set of weapons against them. The protection systems won't be able to do anything against the Orlicans and the more speedy targets will fear your mistrals. Well, we'll switch to the pages of history for now, but we'll return to the Sidam 25 mistral in a short while and conduct some field tests. What makes a tank a tank? and not just an armored car. First of all, it's Caterpillar tracks that guarantee great off-road performance. They also allow for a significant increase of the machine's weight, which means reinforced armor and a more powerful weapon. But everything comes at a price. Caterpillar tracks are very expensive and heavy. And even though the tracks are made of the strongest steel, they still have their limits and their lifespan is limited. 
Also, let's not forget about the fact that the process of rotating these multi-ton discs drains a significant amount of horsepower. Because of all these reasons, wheeled armored machines also stayed relevant over the years despite the popularity of tanks. Usually, they had weaker weapons and armor, but they were also a lot cheaper, lighter, and faster on roads. For example, the most advanced German armored cars during World War II were barely as heavy as the good old Panzer II, but they were faster and had an unmatched fuel efficiency. For example, the SD KFZ 234 with a diesel engine was able to drive for up to a thousand kilometers without refueling. After the war, it turned out that armored cars were quite effective in regions like South Africa. The sandy savannas over there have roads solid enough to keep the wheels from sinking. The caterpillars, on the other hand, can't stand this amount of sand and break a lot faster under these conditions. One of the first nations to realize that was France. The Panard Company took their AML armored car, installed a 90mm weapon on it, and basically turned it into a light tank. Then there was the even more powerful AMX-10 with a 105mm weapon. They could easily damage outdated tanks like the T-54, and it was already enough to justify their use. Because of these powerful weapons, everybody started calling them wheeled tanks, which wasn't a very wise naming, since it kind of eliminated the distinction between tanks and armored cars. The Italians went even further. In 1984, they launched a project to create a combination of a speedy recon machine and a tank destroyer with a 105mm weapon similar to those on German Leopard and the American M60. The result took form of a 25-ton wheeled machine that we know as the Centaur. Basically, it was a fast counterpart of the early Leopards and the AMX-30, but with wheels, thinner armor, and lower weight. That meant that it was easier to carry on planes, and we still remember that wheels were cheaper than caterpillars. Thus, the Italians were the first nation in the world to have created a wheeled machine that could compete with MBTs. Later, the Centauro was sold to Spain and Oman, and they also gave some of them to Jordan. The Japanese created and took into service their own machine of this type, the Type 16. They had a good road network all over the country, and off-road, well, there wasn't much difference off-road. Those mountains were too hard for tanks and armored cars altogether. Was it enough to talk about the triumph of wheeled constructions over the ones with caterpillars? Probably not. When they tried using the Centauro in Somali, they discovered lots of problems with this machine. The 105mm cannon was too powerful for local conflicts, while the machine clearly lacked more protection, so they had to hastily install some reactive Romor armor. The wheeled chassis also wasn't extremely reliable. In theory, it was, but in reality, with those awful Somalian roads, they had to change wheels all the time. Still, the Centauro turned out to be quite an effective recon and surveillance machine, thanks to the good commander's panoramic sight. Wheeled tanks were of great help to their Caterpillar-fitted colleagues, but of course, they couldn't replace them completely. Adding some armor or a heavier weapon would inevitably increase the machine's mass, and its limit depends exactly on wheels. Making them bigger wouldn't do. There wasn't much bigger to begin with, and adding a fifth axle would lead to enlarging the machine's profile, which would create problems for anyone trying to carry these vehicles over in a cargo plane. In the end, each tech found its own place in the ecosystem. After all, not every machine needs heavy armor and powerful guns, but these light machines can be a lot faster, so why not use wheels and gain some advantage?
We have already dealt with light tanks, SPGs and NBTs. But with SPAAs, we need to wait until most nations receive some worthy contestants. Finally, with the arrival of the Sidam 25 Mistral to the Italian tech tree, we have enough top missile carriers to test them against each other and find out which is the best. What else is here besides Italy? America sent the ADATS. The USSR is obviously represented by the Tunguska. The Stroma enters the competition from Britain. And the French and the Germans pick their versions of the Roland to compete for them. Round 1. A smoking, sick, stylish race over sands, snows and swamps. Of course, we do realize that it's not the speed that is the most valuable attribute for an AA tech. But there are still some situations where you have to quickly change flanks or retreat from enemy fire. Let's begin. Ready? Go! The contestants dart forward, and we can't see a clear leader of the race just yet. But here we come to sand dunes, and the Italian machine starts to drag behind. In the snow, the distance becomes even further. In the front, there are the Germans and the British. Next to them go the French and the Soviet competitors. And in the rear, there are the ADATs and the Sidam. The situation remains the same in the swamps as well. And there's the finish line. The British Stromer comes in first, followed by the German Roland, with the third place shared by France and the USSR. The ADATS finishes shortly after that, and the last over the line is the Italian Sidam. Round 2 AA Shooting Range The contestants need to shoot down two targets as fast as possible. A hovering helicopter and a supersonic plane. And action! Everyone starts with the helicopter and grounds it immediately. Though the Italian team needed a short delay to prepare the self-homing missile for launch. On the other hand, the Sidam is the first one to shoot down the second target. The missile easily catches up with it and destroys it without any second attempts. Next to report are the crews from the US and the USSR. Shortly after that, the Rollins report as well. They were late because they had to reload. The problem was that the British Stroma, it doesn't have a proximity fuse, and getting a direct hit from such a distance turned out to be quite a task. Final round. Trap shooting. The contestants need to quickly destroy an unexpected target. This is one of the most crucial parameters for any missile carrier. And action! At some point we see an aircraft appearing from behind a mountain. The contestants lock onto the target almost simultaneously. Launch! The ADATS is the first one to register a hit, and the Mistral comes right after it. This time, the Italians turned their homing head on in advance which is a wise trick to keep in mind. Next successful strike comes from the Soviet crew, and the last to finish are both Roland's and the British Stroma. The tests are through. Let's see what we have here. Third place goes to the Soviet Tunguska. Its high agility and great missiles allow it to control the sky and quickly change positions if necessary. The Sidam 25 Mistral takes the silver medal. It is slower than the others, yes, but its weapons totally compensate for the lack of mobility. The missiles here are easy to use and extremely deadly at the same time. And finally, the winner of today's triathlon is the American ADATS. It has eight of the fastest, most powerful missiles that leave no chance to anyone that gets in its sight. Moreover, there's a thermal scanner, a modern radar, and 450 APDS rounds. Congrats to the winner! And now, time to answer your questions.
The first message was sent by a player called Akos Dobos. How come night vision is green colored? Hi there. The thing is, our eyes react differently to different colors. We best perceive green color at wavelength about 550 nanometers. At the same time, red or purple color of the same intensity seem less bright to us. It's quite logical, really. Our ancestors needed to see both predators and prey among green leaves and grass. And the evolution eventually took care of it. Because of that, they choose luminophores for night vision systems because they glow green if you bombard them with electrons. Any other color would seem dimmer or would require more electrons for the same brightness. A user called Gus Gilanis asks, how do you make it so that you can use the right mouse button to zoom in when playing planes? I screwed up my controls. Please help, Bruce. If you're talking about the usual zooming, you'll find it in Common and then View Controls. It's called Zoom Camera. You can bind it to anything, including the right mouse button. And if you mean the tracking zoom, go to Aircraft. Camera control and tracking camera enemy. Then there is a question sent by Gray Fox. I try to use night vision mode with the ASU 57, but I can't use it when I'm in my sight or binoculars. Hi, that's because not all of the crew members have night vision modules. In the ASU 57 in particular, only the driver has it. So if you look at the battlefield through the eyes of another member of the crew, you won't be able to use it. Another question came from Marwin Alonsege. Is the engine on, off, good for silent attacks in low tier? Mostly, no. Turning the engine off is most useful when you want to become less visible in the IR spectrum, but thermal sights only exist on higher ranks. Of course, a working engine can give you out even on the lowest tiers simply because it's quite loud. But it's not that important as being seen directly on your opponent's radars. And the last question for today was written by Nikolai Maroz. How can I train the same voice as the narrator? Well, at least similar. Well, some of it will come on its own. Try living some dozens of years more and you'll find out that you definitely sound more like me. <laughs> Also, reading stuff out loud helps too. And, of course, you have to look good. But that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. So come on, people. Subscribe to the channel and press that bell button. Now you gotta leave a like. And tell us what you think in the comments below. See you in a week.